I'm really excited about this next presentation because I'm a Buddhist and Gabe is going to take us to enlightenment with his presentation, What the Buddha Can Tell Us About Marketing. All right. Thank you so much. Can you guys hear me all right? Perfect. All right, everybody, indulge me for a second. We've been overloading you with information, so I want to shut your brain off for just a brief second here. So I want everyone to close their eyes. I want everyone to take a deep breath, and I want you to inhale for three seconds, and then exhale for three seconds. All right, thank you all so much for doing that. I don't know if you realize this, but just by doing that, you decreased your metabolism, you slowed your heart rate, and you decreased your blood pressure. So let's get into this presentation and what the Buddha can teach us about marketing. So I'm gonna explore this idea in Buddhism of the, the marks of existence. And in Buddhism, these are, these are what are we call patterns uh, that we fall into as humans. So I'm gonna use a use case for this to start off uh, with a competitor that we all may be facing in this room, the one and only Amazon. So Amazon, as you know, it's just been in a rip in the marketplace. And I'm a student of Warren Buffett, and I really like to understand what companies' competitive advantages are. So I want to understand what they call is their competitive moat. How wide is it, and how do they protect their business with it? So let's explore some of Amazon's for, for a brief second. So Jeff Bezos, he's the CEO of Amazon. He was recently named uh, the greatest living CEO by Harvard Business Review. I think they excluded Brett and Margie in that, or I think they would have been the greatest living CEOs, but so phenomenal, phenomenal CEO, built a great organization. A couple of quick facts about Jeff Bezos, I don't know if you knew this, he's from Albuquerque, New Mexico. He notoriously does not need an alarm clock to wake up, and he insists on getting eight hours of sleep every single day. He will not operate without eight hours of sleep. He's also done a pretty good job at creating a culture within Amazon, so if you know anything about Amazon's culture, uh, they really stress this idea of frugality, and there's great stories around the desk uh, door that he created and how he insists new employees use these desk doors, desk doors as a way to save money. But it's this picture of Jeff Bezos that absolutely sent the internet crazy. So they snapped this picture of him, and they said, Jeff Bezos is jacked, right? Bionic man getting too big for Sun Valley, and it it created this meme on the internet of Jeff Bezos called Swole Jeff Bezos. And if you don't know what Swole is, it means swollen, you got big muscles, right? So this internet went crazy, right? So started, <laughs> they started looking at Jeff Bezos in 1998 and how he's evolved as a person, <laughs> right? I sell books, now I sell whatever I want. I'm Jeff Bezos. This is one of my favorite comments. Jeff Bezos looks like a bodyguard for Jeff Bezos. <laughs> so, okay. Jeff Bezos, competitive advantage for Amazon? Probably, probably. Let's explore, let's explore a few others. Let's look at capital expenditures within Amazon. So capital expenditure is money that we spend for a fixed asset a corporation does, typically land, big pieces of hardware. And if you look at the top CapEx spending within 2016, you're gonna see a lot of big companies on here. What I think is really interesting about this chart is you, you know, it's pretty obvious Exxon needs to spend a lot of money to go and drill for oil. The fact that Amazon's in the top four and you see technology companies outspending big infrastructure companies like Intel, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty outstanding amount of money. Um, so had to put this piece in here. Amazon actually spent more money in CapEx last year than the entire state of Arizona spent on its education system. That's not a good thing. We're one of the worst states in the country when it comes to education spending. So there's my plea to please go talk to your state lawmakers. Tell them we need to spend more money in education. It's very important. <laughs> Okay, now back to the numbers. So let's look at Amazon and what they've spent cumulatively over pretty much the last nine years because they got into this game late. And if you look in their totality, they've spent about $45 billion, which is a staggering amount of money. So how much is $45 billion? So if you were to save $10,000 a day, you would have $45 billion in the year. Anyone want to take a guess? Okay, 14326 now, for anyone that's seen Blade Runner 2049, I'm still trying to wrap my head around that movie and what the future looks like in, in 2049. I cannot imagine the future in the year of Blade Runner 14, 326. Okay, 
So we, look, we talked about Jeff Bezos. We talked a little bit about capital expenditures and money that they spend. Let's look at their distribution. So it's estimated that Amazon now has about 120 million square feet in fulfillment centers, which is a staggering amount of space. If you've ever been to an Amazon fulfillment center, here's what it looks like. They are absolutely massive. There's one on the way out of Phoenix on I-10. You can see it. It's huge, absolutely huge. How big is it? So this is a Freedom Tower, one of the largest country, uh, one of the largest towers in the world. If you were to take the space within the Freedom Tower and you were to stack them up, there would be 42, so 42 Freedom Towers, and that would stack up into the stratosphere of the Earth. That's the amount of retail distribution and fulfillment space that Amazon has. So it's a pretty formidable op opponent, right, when you look at Amazon. And we like to, I like to look at this, and we like to look at this idea of creative destruction. So we know when any new innovation comes into the market, there's a natural amount of displacement. And it's no surprise that this year it's projected to have the most amount of retail store closings or most amount of unit store closings in the last 20 years and more than likely more than in the history since they've been tracking this metric. And Amazon's not just affecting retail, Amazon's affecting brands. So Amazon, if you look at their private label brand for, for batteries, is now a third of all online sales. So that, that doesn't mean I'm, Amazon sells a third of all online batteries. That means the Amazon brand of batteries now commands that market share. And it's devastating to the companies that compete with Amazon. I love Kroger. I'm actually long Kroger stock because of this. I think it's an overreaction. But the day that, the day that Amazon announced the Whole Foods acquisition, Kroger lost about $17 billion off their market cap. Okay, so let's recap for a second. So what's their competitive advantage? Is it Bezos and his 24-inch biceps? Is it the 45 billion they spend in CapEx? Is it the 120 million square feet? You, you could say it's all of that. You could say it's all of that. And how do you compete with that? Us as marketers, you put, you've seen this slide a few times today. We like to think that technology will solve all of our problems. People that sell these products want you to think that their product will solve, solve all your problems and allow you to compete with Amazon. But what if I told you there was a way to compete with Amazon and the strategy is thousands of years old. Okay, so now I'm gonna get into my crash course in Buddhism. So Buddhism believes in this principle of called the marks of existence. As I mentioned before, it's a pattern that we fall into as humans. And two of these patterns, is, let's talk about them briefly. So one of them is this idea of impermanence. The other is this idea of self. So let's talk about impermanence for a second. This idea of impermanence is that everything around us is impermanent, that whatever arises will cease, that all of our possessions will eventually go away. And as humans, we naturally uh, think of loved ones, people that we care deeply about that could pass away at some point in time, and naturally that causes quite a bit of anxiety and pressures in our life. So I know what you're thinking, how is this related to marketing? So there's actually this very interesting study done by this company called Qubit, and they looked at 120 million purchases across the web. And they wanted to understand what really drove conversion, and what really drove the metric that they used was revenue per visitor. And they found that these two techniques drove two to 14 times more revenue per visitor than a lot of very sophisticated A-B testing or, variable or variance testing. And these two techniques were using scarcity and use an urgency within your marketing message. And if you look at those two techniques, you'll notice that they're deeply rooted in this philosophy of impermanence, right? The idea that we were going to miss out on something if we do not purchase this item. And it's no surprise, you see this a lot throughout the web. So this is actually on hotels.com. If you ever booked on hotels.com, you'll notice immediately they'll tell you how many rooms are left on the site. They'll tell you when someone just booked the room that you wanted to book, the instant that they book it, so that you feel more pressure to book that room. Redfin, which is an online um, real estate company, now tells you if a home is hot, they'll say there's a 70% chance this home will sell within this time frame. And a bit more old school, you even see magazines use this tactic as a way to drive urgency within event-based marketing. So Science Ranch 2014, just a few spots left, better go now. So my question to you in the audience is to take a second, think through what are your scarcity or urgency points, trigger points, 
and jot, and jot a few of them down. So it could be appointment availability if you're in the healthcare sector, it could be competition uh, within individuals, it could be inventory, time, or special promotion. Any one of these things could, could be those trigger points. Okay, so that's impermanence. Let's get to the, the next mark of existence, which is this idea of self. So this idea of self is that all phenomena have no substance or reality independent of the mind. So perception really is reality to us. If we perceive something to be true, it probably is true in your mind. And where this really affects us as humans is the perception or the reality of who we are as individuals. What archetype am I? Archetype am I? Am I a man, am I a woman, a father, a grandfather, a digital marketer? And when these, these perceptions of ourselves don't come true or we fail to live up to them, we cause ourselves quite a bit of suffering, we cause ourselves quite a bit of anxiety. So I thought this was interesting from a brand perspective because really this idea of self as marketers is this idea of brand that we perpetuate within our organizations. And I want to focus on uh, a particular part of this brand uh, that we like to focus on as marketers, and that's the identity. So one of the suggestions that I have in a really interesting study that came out is owning your company's myth. So I, I, uh, you, you've heard a lot about storytelling, and uh, there's this great study, great book, uh, and it looked at our species as homo sapiens. So we're the apex predators on this planet, us humans, our particular species, homo sapiens. And this gentleman wanted to see what caused us to be the apex predator on this planet or the dominant species. And he attributed it to these three things. So he attributed it to these three revolutions. So one he called the cognitive revolution. The second he called the agricultural revolution. And the third was a scientific revolution. But what was, what was instrumental in that first revolution, the cognitive revolution, was our ability to form common myths so that we could cooperate in large numbers to solve problems together. So what he found was that initially, when we were hunter-gatherers, we only trusted people in our own tribes. But when we had the ability to form a common myth around a religion or a, around um, a way of life, then I trusted you enough to solve a problem with you. And this caused uh, and allowed us to have tremendous leaps in evolutionary chain to become the apex predator. And so it's no secret that uh, you know, two of the Two of the organizations that are best at this are sports teams, right? I'm an ASU fan, you're an ASU fan, we both hate at U of A, let's just coordinate and, and let's solve problems together. I don't really hate U of A, I love U of A. Uh, but same thing, political organizations use the same concept. So brands know this, right? So uh, Apple, notoriously their story, what does the Apple symbolize, right? It's rooted in myth. Some would say it symbolizes lust and knowledge, that idea of the forbidden fruit, that idea of knowledge. Nike, another interesting example. I don't know if you knew this, but Nike was the winged goddess of victory in Greek mythology. So, and that, those principles stood for, for flight, speed, and, and victory. So my question to you all is what is your common myth? What, what is something that you can capitalize on within your organizations to, to help forge cooperation within large numbers? So another way you can control your brand is online. Uh, Google, I'm, a, I'm a, obviously a big fan of Google, and Search, search engine result pages. So I like to think of them as your brand's digital brand uh, window display. And so to, this may just look like a search engine result page. To most people, to me, this is like a Picasso painting because it's so beautiful. Uh, so why is it so beautiful? So this is a perfectly laid out search engine, search engine result page. And everything that you see within this page is very intentional. So Nike makes it a point to go and buy this branded term and I know a lot of you are thinking, why would I buy the branded term? Or why does Nike buy the branded term when they, they appear number one in the organic results? Well, the reality is they run studies on this and they find if you buy that branded term, you get about an 89% incremental lift in your traffic. So then you'll see they use the site links underneath to highlight their new product promotion. Uh, I love this. Uh, they, take, they take the opportunity within their title tag of, of the homepage to highlight you know, what Nike's uh, value proposition is, or, you know, aspirationally, their inspiration innovation for every athlete in the world, instead of just saying, you know, running shoes, what we tend to do as marketers. They take advantage of these site links, and then they also take advantage of a knowledge graph. So all this is very intentional. So my question to you is, what are you doing in your organizations to own the myth? 
and what are you doing to own your search engine result page? And these are some things that we can, we can help you with. So I had this epiphany. I was in a pitch meeting, and I was talking about this very same concept. In fact, several, several people were in the room with me when I was in this meeting. And I was, I was explaining some examples of a client could take advantage of this idea of scarcity and this idea of urgency. And I had this, this really empathetic moment uh, from, from the client where she said, the last thing that I want to do is create more anxiety in an already stressful situation when we were highlighting some of the ways to do this. And it really, this really struck me and it really got me thinking. And it, it goes back to this idea of these marks of existence. And what I failed to mention was that there's actually three marks of existence. We only talked about the first two, which were impermanence and self. But the third most important mark is this idea of suffering. And they believe that suffering is caused by the first two marks of existence. So this, this idea, this anxiety that we feel within the loss of life and our loved ones, this anxiety that we feel and not living up to the people that we perceive ourselves to be really causes a lot of the suffering that we endure as humans. And if you were to ask Buddha, if you were to ask you know, Buddhist philosophers, they would say, I teach one thing and one thing only, and that's to end suffering, not to perpetuate it. So the question is, what do I do? You know, just, these are very effective tactics. So it, it brought me to this story, this parable within Buddhism. Um, so this is, this is the Colorado River. And if I were to take you to this beautiful river and take you down to the banks of this river and ask you, what defines the Colorado River? You may say it's the water that defines the river. You may say it's the fish that define the river or the current or the sand or the gravel and the patterns that they construct. And I would say, OK. And then if we were to go back to that same spot in the river the next morning and ask you again what defines the Colorado River, the reality that is that that same water is now miles down the river. Those fish aren't there anymore. The sand is completely different. The current most likely is different. Everything's different. So the things that we think define the river don't define them at all. It's these conditions that define the river. It's everything in its totality that defines the river. And so that got me thinking about how do we extend this as marketers into our brand? And it got me thinking, what defines our brand as marketers? And particularly as digital marketers. And typically, what defines us is we are these conversion events. You know, we obsess over these conversion events and click-through rates. And not to say that they're not important, but that's really what defines us. And it's not, it's not the conditions that define us. It's these individual causes. And so I'm here to, to really say, you know, us as marketers, we're better than that, right? We're better than, we're more than selling more stuff. We're more than putting more widgets out into the world. We're more than the web traffic that we report on. We're more than these form fills. We're more than these phones. I'm um, sorry, we're more than uh, these phone calls. Um, we have the ability to really change the products and the services that we represent. So I love brands. I consider brands that represent themselves as conditions. So brands that, what I'd say, are verbs, not nouns. Now, someone else is going to say that uh, in a presentation, and I think that's a beautiful quote. So you know these, these folks really define the experience. And a way that we can end this suffering is to focus on the brand experience from a lot of the presentations that you heard today. You know, brand experience, it creates value for the customer and it builds affinity for your brand. So a great example of this is Southwest. So uh, and plenty of you probably fly Southwest. If you've flown it and witnessed this, you're probably not in the minority. This happens a lot. Stop, clap, stop. In the middle, a man in the back. My name is David, and I'm here to tell you that. Shortly after take off, first things first, there's soft drinks and coffee to quench your thirst. But if you want another kind of drink, then just holler. Alcohol and beverage, it's a cost you five dollars. <laughs> Fantastic rap. So if you look at these on YouTube or any of the video uh, video platforms that they're on, they've generated tens of millions of views for Southwest and, and reinforce you know their brand's playfulness and do all these things to perpetuate that brand. But what's really interesting, and, and this is from a book called The Power of Moments, 
uh, the analytics team at Southwest looked at, they were, they were able to isolate the focus announcement. And they were able to run some calculations. If they were just able to double the amount of those funny announcements, it would generate about $170 million in revenue for them. So pretty interesting. So a couple of digital tips. Uh, like I mentioned, I'm a digital guy, so I like to give digital tips. Uh, some, another way you can perpetuate your brand's experience or highlight it is, you know, we like to use search engines as a proxy for the types of information that your customers are looking for. So this was a particular customer, and it was a household product, a cleaner. And what we found is that there was a substantial search volume around the safety of this product. People wanted to know, what happens if I ingest this? What if my dog ingests it? What if I get this in my eyes? And the issue was, this type of information wasn't readily available on their site. They had to go to a third-party site to find it. And so the suggestion for them was to go and put this information on the site so to create a better experience for their customers. So something else that you can do within analytics is you can turn on on-site search. So that'll give you the ability to go and see what types of queries people are looking for on your site. Uh, and usually people do that when they go into the search bar. It's like a point of frustration. They can't find something. They're desperate, so they type it in the search bar. And you can actually see what these queries are, and you can make a concerted effort to go and make them easier to find. Or sometimes, when you see those queries, people are searching for a product or a service that you may not even offer. So in some instances, this type of information can give you some insight and new product or services that you should offer. And then always talk to your customers. You know, there's, there's a multitude of very inexpensive but very effective tools that allow you to have these one-on-one -on -one conversations with your customers and understand where they're frustrated, like user testing or like a, the Google survey tool. So I want to take this back. So, you know, if, if the Buddha teaches that I teach one thing and one thing only, and that's to end suffering, and we were to look at going back to Amazon and what is their competitive moat, what is their competitive advantage, and going back to the things that in the beginning I alluded to may be their competitive advantage. What's interesting is if you were to ask Jeff Bezos himself, he would say, you can be competitor focused, you can be product focused, you can be technology focused, but in my view, obsessive customer focus is by far, by far the most protective. Thank you. All right. So We've given you guys a lot of information. We're going to take a quick break here for about 15 minutes. So we will see you back here in 15 minutes. Thank you all so much.